Lord, as we come to your scriptures this morning, we open the scriptures believing this to be the living word of God that continues to speak. We believe it to be profitable for teaching, correction, and training in righteousness. We expect to hear God speak to us through scripture. So, Father, I ask this morning for the gift of preaching to be able to preach the oracles of God by the power of God so that your word and your voice would be heard this morning to your glory and to our eternal good. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. This is the gospel in which we believe. There is one eternal triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Creator of all things, the giver of life. Humans are unique in God's creation because we are created in the image of God. We are thinking beings, we are moral beings, we have the ability to love and we have the ability to worship. All humans have taken the soul and the life that God has given to us and instead of living the moral lives we ought, instead of loving others the way we should, instead of worshiping the one true God, we have all rebelled and gone our own way. Bible word for this is sin. Sin is rebellion against our Creator. Sin separates us from a holy God. Consequence of this sin is it has brought death and bondage to decay upon creation itself. And if that were the end of the story, we would spend eternity separated from this loving God who created us. But the good news of the gospel is that God is rich in mercy and rich in love. And so God the Father has done something for us so that we might be reconciled to Him sent the second person of the eternal triune God, the Son, became flesh, had an active ministry on earth for three years, doing miracles and teaching, demonstrating He was the Son of God. And then in the fullness of time, He bore our sins upon the cross. He died for our sins, and in our place, He died the death that we all deserved. He was buried, and God the Father raised Him from the dead. And the offer of abundant life is for all of those who put their faith in Jesus, who admit that they are a sinner, who fall short of the glory of God, who believes that Jesus is the Son of God, who died on the cross for their sins, and who confesses Jesus as their Savior and Lord. And those who do this are born again, become new creations in Christ, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is the gospel in which we believe. Amen. How do we know this is true? When the Apostle Paul stood in the city of Athens, surrounded by a group of philosophers, a city hundreds of miles away from the place of the crucifixion and resurrection, this was the gospel that he preached to them. And what he said to them is the proof that God has given to us that we know that this is true is Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. You know, in a lot of ways, they're not that much different from us. None of us were eyewitnesses to the crucifixion, nor were we eyewitnesses to the resurrection. Neither were the philosophers in Athens. And so how do we know that the resurrection is true? Why do we put our faith in this Jesus? We've been trying to answer that question by reading the last two chapters from the Gospel of John the last few weeks. And we've seen some reasons why we believe that the, empty, uh, the tomb was empty the resurrection appearances of the glorified Jesus, the fact that Jesus called Mary by name and continues to call us by name. And today, as we look at John chapter 21, we see the fourth and very powerful reason of why it is that you and I continue to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and God raised Him from the dead. So if you've got your copy of the Word of God, I hope that you'll join us in John 21. We're going to read this entire chapter. It's also in your bulletin center section if you want to follow along there. Just a word before we begin, scholars like to debate whether chapter 21 was part of the original gospel. I won't chase that rabbit too much, but I think the evidence is abundant and clear it was part of the original gospel. The reason they ask the question is that the, the story appears to end at the end of chapter 20, and then we have chapter 21, and then the gospel has a second ending there in verses uh, 25, the last verse. 
And so it's, why does the gospel come to a close? And then we have another story, then it comes to a close again. Well, John 21 functions as an epilogue. An epilogue, the official definition, is a concluding section that rounds out the design of a literary work. So if you've read a novel or a some kind of story, and the story comes to an end and comes to a conclusion, but all, there's all these loose ends in the story. You're thinking, well, whatever happened to so-and-so? And what happened about this? And what happened about that? And so the epilogue is the opportunity after the story is over to tie up some loose ends. And Peter is definitely a loose end that needs to be tied up, right? Because without chapter 21, Peter's presence in Acts would be very strange, How did the individual who is the great denier of Jesus become the leader of the church in Jerusalem? How did that happen? John chapter 21 answers that question. Now just as a program note, we skipped over the appearances of Jesus in the upper room to the disciples and Thomas. We're going to come back to that next Sunday and you'll see why we saved it for that. But as we walk through John chapter 21, let me just make some comments as we read. So after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. The Sea of Tiberias is another word for the Sea of Galilee. So the resurrection appearances we've been reading about have been happening in Jerusalem. The other Gospels make it clear that Jesus had told his disciples, go to Galilee and that's where I will meet you. So finally they have made their way up to Galilee, and Jesus reveals himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin who we unfortunately call Doubting Thomas. We'll read that next week. Nathaniel, the sons of Zebedee, which are James and John, and two other of his disciples were together. So seven of the 11 remaining apostles were there. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we'll go with you. And they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Not really sure whether Peter is returning to his career of fishing, or whether Peter just needs to eat, and so we need to go fishing and get some food. Probably not returning to his career, but as we will see, <coughs> and I apologize, I'm going to cough and hack through this whole thing. Hopefully the Holy Spirit will use that somehow. In the... So just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus, whether this was another one of The resurrection appearances, they don't see Jesus, or Jesus is just a hundred yards away on a dark shore, but they don't recognize as Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. Anybody who's been fishing is very familiar with the unsolicited advice. Hey, you ought to fish over there. So they cast it, and they were not able to haul it in because of the great quantity of fish. Now the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, therefore said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, which is a nice translation of the Greek that says, for he was naked, and he threw himself into the sea. So Simon Peter put on some clothes, he didn't want to meet Jesus in his skivvies. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. And when they got on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, why don't you bring some of the fish that you've just caught? So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. Now, I have no idea why John tells us how many fish were there. There have been endless attempts to try to do that. Many have tried to connect this. There's a prophecy in Ezekiel 47 that talks about the new heavens and the new earth and that when the temple, the dwelling place of God, there will be this river that flows from the temple and it gives life to everywhere it touches and it's full of fish. And many think that that is speaking about uh, that the new heavens and the new earth will have people from every language, tribe, nation, people group. It'll be full of all humanity. Uh, But how 153 connects to that, who knows? Numerologists love this. That's where you give a, a number value to each letter in the alphabet. A's one, B's two, C's three, right? And so you can do that with Greek and Aramaic, and you can add, and you can multiply, and you come up with all sorts of stuff. I like what one commentator said. If John wanted us to know what 153 means, he has hidden it very well. 153 fish. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. 
Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. So Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. And this was the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. This third time he's revealed himself to the twelve. It's not counting his appearance to Mary. Now, before we continue the story, let's just make sure that we understand what's going on here. Do you realize Jesus is reenacting the experience where he called Peter, James, and John to be his disciples. Luke chapter 5, it's almost the exact same story. They had been fishing all night. They had caught nothing. Jesus said, why don't you throw the nets over? They throw the nets over and it's full of fish. Peter is aware he's in the presence of God. He falls down and says, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. And Jesus says to them, from now on you will be fisher of men. Follow me, you will be fisher of men. He's recreating their called experience. Secondly, there's only two times in the Gospel of John that mentions a charcoal fire. There's this one. And then there is the night when Jesus was arrested and all the disciples scatter. And John and Peter follow along to the courtyard of the high priest and they warm themselves around a charcoal fire. And that's where the servant girl says, hey, weren't you with Jesus? Peter says, no, I don't even know him. So he is recreating the call experience of Peter, James, and John. He is recreating the denial of Peter around the charcoal fire. Add to that that there are loaves of bread and fish that Jesus takes and feeds them. Reminding them of three years worth of ministry and miracles, their experience with Jesus. Now that wasn't enough. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Lord, you know that I love you. So he said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, then feed my sheep. Sometimes we focus on uh, the words used here for love. Um, agape is the highest form of love in Greek. It's God's love for us. Phileo is that brotherly love. And so Jesus is asking Simon, do you love me? Do you agape me? Do you love me like God loves you? Peter's response is, well, you know that I have brotherly love for you. Second time, Jesus says, Simon, do you love me with agape love like God's love for you? Peter says, you know that I brotherly love you. Third time, Jesus says, well, then do you phileo me? Do you brotherly love me? And Peter says, yes, you know that I brotherly love you. I don't know. Sometimes we make a lot out of that. I don't know that we, we can necessarily. John uses those two words for love interchangeably in the gospel. Not to mention this entire section. He's using synonyms all through it. There's, he uses lambs and sheep. He uses feed and tend. He uses two words for no and two words for love. I think the bigger significance here is on the number three. The question being asked three times. He's reenacted his call experience. He's reenacted and reminding him of the miracles and the years he spent. He's reenacted the charcoal fire where he denied. Now he's reenacting the three times. And then notice the first question Simon, do you love me more than these? Do you remember in the upper room? When Jesus says to his disciples, when the, when the Last Supper is over, we're about to go out, he's telling them, I'm going to be arrested, all of you are going to scatter. And you remember what Peter says? Not me. All the rest of these will fall away, but I will never fall away. So here's Jesus saying, Simon, you remember that? Remember me telling you that all of you will fall away, and you stood up and you said that you loved me more than the rest? You, you remember that? Simon, do you love me more than these? He's reminding them of their calling. He's reminding them of three years worth of miracles and time spent with Jesus. He's reminding Peter of his boldness and brashness to say, I'll never fall away. He's reminding them of that charcoal fire, his, his greatest moment and his greatest failure. And reminding them of his three denials. He says, Simon, if you love me, Feed my lambs. Peter at the end says, Lord, you know everything. Peter gives up. 
You know, I, I've, I've tried boasting. I've tried to do all this stuff. <coughs> you know I couldn't do it. You know everything now. But Peter does say, but, but Jesus, you know that I love you. You know all my failures, but at this point, you know that I love you. So Jesus says, feed my sheep. Truly I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. When you're old, you will stretch out your hands. Another will dress you and carry where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. So here Jesus is commissioning Peter to feed his lamb. So in the gospel, gospel in John chapter 10, Jesus talks about how he is the good, sheep, good shepherd uh, those who follow him are his sheep. They hear his voice. They follow him. And now Jesus is saying to Peter, look, I'm the good shepherd, but you have a role to, to tend my lambs, feed my sheep. They belong to me, but you are the under shepherd. But then he talks about how Peter was going to die. Peter will be crucified when he's martyred by uh, the Roman government some 30 years later. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. The one who had leaned back during the supper and said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? Talking about John. And when Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it's my will that he remain until I come, what is it that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say that he was not to die, but just that if it was my will, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things, who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Peter says, well, what about this man? Jesus' commission to Peter was different than Jesus' commission to John. Peter, James, and John, for that fact, they all had a different calling. James, who was at this fishing event, was one of the first disciples to be martyred. Acts chapter 12 tells us how Herod put him to death. Peter would be an apostle to the Jews. He would be a leader of the Jewish Christian church in Jerusalem. Eventually, he would flee to Rome. He would be martyred by Nero some 30 years later. John's role was much different. John was not martyred, but he was persecuted. John uh, wrote this gospel he probably ministered in Ephesus, and then he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos where he received the revelation, lived to be quite an old man. John's calling was different. So back to our reasons, why is it that we believe, that we should believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead? We've talked about the, that the, the tomb was empty. We've talked about the resurrection appearances of the glorified Christ. We've talked about how Jesus continues to call us by name. And what we see today is that Jesus changes the lives of those who believe in him. Jesus changes the lives of those who believe in him. Notice the progression of the story. The Last Supper, they go out into the garden. Jesus is arrested. The disciples scatter. Peter and John slink to the courtyard as they watch the trials of Jesus. Peter denies even knowing Jesus. After the empty tomb, what do they do? They return to their homes. Later than that, they are in a locked room because they are afraid that they're going to be next, arrested next. Here we find them. They're just going fishing. How do they appear in Acts? In Acts, they're in the upper room waiting to be clothed with power from on high. After that, Peter is boldly preaching the gospel in downtown Jerusalem. He's arrested, threatened, told to stop doing that. What does he do? He returns to publicly preaching the gospel. They arrest him again. They beat him. Tell him again, stop preaching in the name of Jesus. What does he do? He returns to publicly preaching the gospel. They arrest him again. They put him in prison. An angel busts him out. And what does he do? He returns to the temple publicly preaching the gospel. How is it that Peter gets from being afraid in a locked room, a fear that he's going to be next to be arrested, to being the guy just 40 days later that's arrested over and over and just won't stop talking about Jesus? The fact that Jesus changed his life. And if you notice in the story, the empty tomb didn't do it. They saw the empty tomb. They just went back home. Even the resurrected appearances of Jesus didn't quite do it because they just went fishing. 
But it was at this moment when, when Jesus interacted with Peter and Jesus changed Peter's life that changed the game and he became a totally different person. Jesus changes the lives of those who believe in him. What happened to the uh, 12 apostles? Biblical history tells us of James, Peter, and John. Tradition and other writings tell us about the others. Andrew took the gospel to Greece where he was martyred. Thomas took the gospel to India. Philip took the gospel to Asia Minor. Matthew wrote his gospel and believed to preach the gospel in Ethiopia. Bartholomew took the gospel to Armenia. Simon the Zealot preached the gospel in Africa and then was martyred in Persia. Matthias, who took Judas's place, is thought to have preached the gospel in Syria where he was martyred. Not only did the apostles believe in the resurrected Jesus, but they changed their lives and they risked their entire lives because Jesus changes the lives of those who believe in him. I mentioned uh, in passing last Sunday uh, the story of Charles Colson, Chuck Colson. Um, this service will be more familiar with this story than the next service probably, but Charles Colson was a special counsel to President Richard Nixon. Uh, he was a key figure in the Watergate scandal. He pled guilty to obstruction of justice. Uh, he served seven months in prison. And through that process in 1973, Chuck Colson was radically saved. When he was released from prison, he formed the Prison Fellowship, which continues to take the gospel to those who are incarcerated today. He wrote over 30 books. And in one of his books, he wrote this. When I am challenged on the resurrection, my answer is always that the disciples and 500 others gave eyewitness accounts of seeing Jesus risen from the tomb. But then I'm asked, how do we know they were telling the truth? Maybe they were perpetuating a hoax. My answer to that comes from a very unlikely source. Watergate. Watergate involved a conspiracy perpetuated by the closest aides to the President of the United States, the most powerful men in America who were intensely loyal to their President. But one of them, John Dean, turned state's evidence, that is, he testified against the President, as he put it, quote, to save his own skin. And he did so only two weeks after informing the President about what was really going on. Two weeks. To cover up the lie could only be held together for two weeks. And then everyone else jumped ship in order to save themselves. And the fact is that those who were around the president, they were facing embarrassment, maybe a little bit of prison, but nobody's life was at stake. But what about the disciples? Twelve powerless men, peasants really, were facing not just embarrassment or political disgrace, but beating, stonings, and execution. And every single one of the disciples insisted to their dying breaths that they had physically seen Jesus bodily raised from the dead. <coughs> don't you think that one of those apostles would have cracked before being beheaded or stoned? That one of them would have made a deal with the authorities, but none did. Men will give their lives for something they believe to be true. They will never give their lives for something they know to be false. Now, you can take it from an expert in cover-ups. I've lived through Watergate. That nothing less than a resurrected Christ could have caused those men to maintain to their dying whispers that Jesus is alive and Jesus is is Lord. When people met the resurrected, glorified Jesus and believed, it changed their lives for good. And when that happens, you can't just go back to fishing. Now, I'm not saying the fishing as a hobby is bad or commercial fishing is bad, but you just can't return to your normal life because Jesus Christ changes the lives of those who put their faith in him. And how are we changed? The forgiveness of sin sets us free. You know, so often when we spout out the gospel and we talk about the forgiveness of sins, this is just something we just throw out there and just rolls out. Our sins are forgiven. Our sins are forgiven. Don't take that lightly. The joy of no longer feeling the guilt and the burden of our past sins and failures. The joy of knowing the moral ruler of the universe who knows you better than you know yourself and who knows all of your sins. The joy of knowing the one and whom you're going to stand before one day has canceled out your sin debt and you bear it no more. That's freedom. And when you are free, you become a new creation in Christ. How does Jesus change our lives? It is the gift of the Holy Spirit that gives us new birth. When we put our faith in Christ, we are born again. We become new creations in Christ. We were dead in our sins and Christ makes us alive. Whatever biblical image that you want. The Peter before Pentecost looks nothing like the Peter after Pentecost. 
And there's no other explanation with that other than the fact that he was filled with the Spirit, became a new creation in Christ. He was born again. He changes our lives. We experience the forgiveness of sins. We experience the gift of the Holy Spirit that gives new birth. But also our new lives have a purpose and they have a calling. We have a commission from the Lord to follow him and to join him in his greater purpose in our own unique gifting and calling. And Peter and John and James, they all had different callings. John's calling was to live a long life, minister in Ephesus, write the gospel, receive this beautiful revelation as recorded in Scripture. James' calling was to live a short life. He was to be a martyr. Peter's calling was to be a leader of the church in Jerusalem and then into Rome. But whatever our calling is, whatever your specific commission is, whether it's to to be a nurse in downtown Fort Worth and share the compassion of Christ in a meaningful way or to be a teacher in Fort Worth ISD and shine light into the darkness or to be in the C-suite somewhere of a Fortune 500 company leading people to Christ or to serve our community as a firefighter, a police officer, or a social worker or to help people solve very real problems like plumbers or electricians or to be a stay-at-home mom and raising disciples for the next generation. Whatever your specific commission is, the reality is When you meet the resurrected Jesus and you put your faith in Jesus, your life is changed. And you can't just go back to fishing. It is a new life. And it puts us on a completely different path. Now, does that calling and commission make us perfect? I wish. It didn't make Peter perfect. Read the rest of the story. Peter still had to learn the fact that all of the Gentiles were welcome to be part of the kingdom of God. It didn't make John the Baptist perfect. John the Baptist sat in prison, still had his doubts going, if you're the Christ, how come I'm still here in prison? We still have questions. We still have struggles. But there's no doubt that it changes the trajectory of our lives. And there's no other explanation for that simple truth than Jesus changes the lives of those who believe in him. Again, the old hymn that says, you ask me how I know he lives. Why? Because he lives within me, and he has changed my life, and I have become a new person, just like Jesus did with Peter. Our song of response this morning is In Christ Alone. And we have this beautiful opportunity to sing through the gospel story, the gospel story that radically changed our life, the gospel story that has set us on a new course. Pay attention to the lyrics. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. Why does he command our destiny? Because he has changed us and given us a new life, and we are headed a completely different direction. Amen.